I've told you how the different particles in the free plasma arrange themselves depending upon the local electric potential. Here's how the ions arrange themselves, and here is how the electrons arrange themselves. The electrons, in other words, are less and less likely to be fined at places where this potential is negative. And of course, a negative potential is generated by other electrons. So another way to say this is electrons don't like to be too close together. The parameter that governs how unhappy they are when they're surrounded by members of their own kind is that temperature parameter there. As the temperature increases, eh, they don't care. They could be in an overdensity. Like something like this doesn't bother them as much. But as the temperature lowers, they're going to want to spread out more and more. So how does this thermal equilibrium interact how does this thermal equilibrium interact with the field that a test particle that we're going to introduce, so we'll have a little special electron here marked by an X, how does this thermal equilibrium interact with the field that a particle generates? So let me just quickly remind you how electromagnetism works. Here's the electric potential. If you take the second derivative of that, that's equal to the charge density at that point divided by the uh, permittivity of the vacuum. And the solution to this equation is very simple. If we assume for a second that we're dealing with a point charge, so all the charge is focused at one tiny little spot, and that total charge is Q, then the potential produced by that charge Q, if we assume it's at the origin, scales as 1 over R. So the further you are away from that point charge, the larger R is, the lower and lower the field is, and that scaling is 1 over R. All right. So now what happens when we introduce a test charge, not into the vacuum, in that case, at least in the classical field theory, it would simply produce the 1 over R potential. But what happens if we introduce that electron in the middle of this thermal plasma? So, in fact, what we have to consider is two effects. If we imagine we introduce a small charge, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna write this as delta P as opposed to, sorry, delta rho as opposed to rho. The reason I write delta rho is just to indicate that I'm putting in something that's a very small perturbation to the system. It's not gonna overall mess up how the plasma is behaving, okay? So the delta rho that effectively comes from putting this charge in actually has two sources. It has, first of all, the density of the charge that I've introduced by hand, right? I've stuck this charge in, but because I stick that charge in, in fact, what's gonna happen is that some of these particles, some of the positive particles, are going to be attracted to it. And some of the negative particles are gonna be repelled by it, right? The electrons are like, oh no, here's an another electron. There goes the neighborhood, right? So they go away. So the effect of this test charge is to have the plasma rearrange itself. And in fact, we can actually write down the effect of that in the following fashion. The total charge that's added to the system because of the rearrangement of the plasma is equal to the electron charge times the density of ions that have been introduced because of this charge minus the density of electrons that have been introduced because of that charge. So all I'm saying is take a little small grid around this. We'll have an overdensity of positive charges and an underdensity of negative charges in that part of the plasma simply because you've introduced this external perturbing charge into the system. So now I have to figure out, okay, how did the balance change because of the introduction of that electron? But I can actually do that because I have these terms up here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna expand this here in a Taylor series. So I have the density of ions is now equal to n naught. We have the standard term in front like this. But now what I'm going to do is have that phi there and write it as 1 minus e phi, or sorry, yes, 1 minus e phi over kt plus some additional terms. And similarly with the electron charge, I'm going to write that as the expansion. And now I have 1 my, uh, 1 plus E phi over KT plus higher order terms. Okay. Now, this phi is going to be altered by the introduction of that charge, and that's what's going to lead to this overall imbalance here. If I plug in these expansions, what I get out the other side is the total charge that I've introduced is equal to the external charge I've introduced, plus this additional term, which actually acts to partially cancel out 
the charge that I see. So I have 2 e squared times n naught over kt times the additional potential that I've created because of the introduction of this charge. Okay? And this term here simply comes from taking this and subtracting this. The zeroth order terms cancel out, and these now add together because I have a minus sign on the electron. Notice that this comes in, the order at which this comes in is at the order of the electron charge squared. So if the electron charge is really weak, okay, this would not have a strong an effect, right? Notice also that if the temperature is really high, this would not have as strong an effect. And you can think about it this way, right? If the, if the plasma, if these particles are moving around in, 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 uh, at a very high temperature, basically, yes, this here might bring some of these in and push some of these away, but these already have so much, so high of an energy that the over density they produce is not as high. Conversely, if these are moving really slowly, then it's possible for this charge here to collect a halo around itself of those positive charges, okay? So, Notice what we have here. We introduce the external charge, but that external charge is partially canceled by this virtual cloud, or in the case of the plasma, a non-virtual cloud, an actual cloud of these positively and negatively charged particles. It depends upon the inverse temperature, but it also depends upon the field that this external charge introduces. So let's see how this nonlinear effect works out. We have now the del squared delta phi term, this small perturbation to the potential that's introduced by the external charge, and that's equal to negative 1 over epsilon naught, okay, plus, or rather, times the external charge effect, but now minus this additional term 2 e squared and naught delta phi over kt. So, on the left hand side now, we have our delta phi. This charge here, as this gets larger, right, this delta phi here also is affected by it, right? As you introduce that little charge with some kind of spatial extent, that leads to the production of an electric potential. But that electric potential also shows up here on the right hand side. The stronger the electric potential that this charge introduces, the stronger the counteracting effect from these positive charges flowing in to partially cancel out the electron you've introduced. So, this now becomes a slightly harder equation than the original one that you know from electrodynamics. The original one is just del squared delta phi equals negative rho over epsilon naught. And in fact, in this case, rho is just the external charge. There's nothing else to rearrange itself. In this case here, we have this new term that appears what I'll do is instead of walking you through how to solve this equation, I'll just give it to you by hand. It turns out that the potential introduced by this small charge delta rho, and what I'm going to say is that it's now a point charge. We actually put it in at a single position, right? All the charge of that test charge is concentrated at a single point, and we'll call that total charge Q. So the induced potential is Q over 4 pi epsilon naught r. Very good, that's the standard electrostatic rule, but we induce also this exponential cutoff where you have e to the power of negative root 2r divided by a constant lambda d. And lambda d just depends upon all these terms here. Lambda d is known as the Debye length after the person who first understood and mathematically defined this process. And lambda d, you can just, by looking at this equation here, write out as equal to the square root of kt over e squared and naught. So how can we understand the modification to classical electrodynamics, or in this case, electrostatics? How can we understand the modification to electrostatics that comes from the effect of this non-empty background of charges. One way to think of it is just to draw the standard potential. So I'm going to draw on this axis here log phi, and on this axis here log r. So in the standard electrodynamics, if this plasma was not present, this would just be a straight line on a log-log plot, because phi would be proportional 
to 1 over r. So that means that log phi is equal to a constant plus, or rather minus, log r. But when we introduce the uh, rearrangement effect, what happens when this external charge induces a potential and that potential then draws in charges of the opposite sign, all of a sudden now when r is very small, this term here is now close to 1. So this part of the line works. But as r gets larger and larger, this term here becomes more and more negative, and so the effect of that charge at long distances starts to drop away. And in fact, it drops away exponentially fast. So in a plasma, if you put in a test charge and go far enough away, in fact, the charge itself becomes invisible to you because of all the rearrangements that happen in the plasma on different scales. As you go further and further away, one way to think of it is that the electric force becomes weaker. Another way to think of it, which is a related, a, a, essentially a different way to look at exactly the same equation, is not to think of a charge here having some kind of constant effect that dies off exponentially, but instead to put these two pieces together. And now we have a story that looks a lot more like the renormalization story we told in the other parts of this module. 